Our time is short. It was a little longer than we thought, but it's short. And I want to get right to the panelists. Just a few words of introduction. Cybersecurity has become one of the key issues of our time. The very real threat of cyber attack in a world that is increasingly dependent on technology is a central strategic issue for all technology-related enterprises. For those of us practicing law in Israel, despite my accent, I'm on the Israeli side of the equation here, this has manifested, my Hebrew doesn't sound like that side either, but um, for those of us who practice in Israel, this is manifested in three primary areas. One, an active startup culture focused on developing tools for providing new and better security. Recent published reports indicated that in 2017 alone, 60 new companies were formed in the cybersecurity space. Next, preparation for and response to cyber attacks. Like all of the world, we've written, witnessed repeated cyber attacks. And we've also faced the need to develop legal tools to address these. And lastly, liability and litigation exposure and cost to companies because of cyber threats. Only last week, the US SEC released guidance on disclosure of cybersecurity risks and incidents, advising companies to ensure that their disclosure controls and procedures take account of cybersecurity risks and noting the implications of cybersecurity incidents for insider trading prohibitions and disclosure compliance. This will obviously greatly increase the responses of our largest international companies to cybersecurity issues. We will try to touch on these issues and other topics during the course of our conversation. Just to start the discussion, consider a hypothetical country with 8 million citizens and two principal credit card companies. Consider further a security breach, which threatens to make available personal identification stored by one of these companies and affecting nearly 40% of the country. With that in the back of your heads, Ariel, please talk us through an attack of this type, touching on responses and the role of counsel. Thanks, Rick. Uh, it's great to be here. Uh, just a quick word to, uh, to the entire team at Robus, uh, to Tamal, to Zohar. Well done. What an amazing, amazing conference. We're all very proud to be here with you. Well done. And, and thank you for putting me in the best panel today. <laughs> I'm really proud to be with these guys. So let's, let's get right to it. Uh, cyber attacks, uh, they're not going anywhere. Uh, it's, 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 it's basic statistics when you see the incredible increase in the amount of cyber attacks. We've just heard two weeks ago in the uh, uh, Munich uh, Defense Conference the, uh, the uh, global damage um, financial damage caused by cyber attacks uh, arrived this year to one trillion US dollars. Uh, the world is becoming more and more connected uh, and human nature is not changing. So everything that stands behind cyber attacks like greed, extortion, terrorism, the will to destabilize a country, maybe a rigged election, all of these wonderful desires that existed in human nature for so many years, well, they're not going anywhere. And that means that we're going to continue and live and be even greater exposed to the risks of cyber attacks. Now, what I'd like to do, I'd like to put aside all the politically motivated cyber attacks and focus uh, on, on what is today the mainstream cyber attack, which is theft of information. That's basically, statistically, we see the most of it. Uh, in terms of numbers, the US, of course, leads by far compared to the rest of the world. But in Europe, the main countries that are the uh, leaders in terms of attacks, uh, rather being victims, are the UK, Germany, Spain, and Belgium. Um, now, everybody speaks about prevention, but we as lawyers would be usually required to, fa to, to face the uh, containment rather than the prevention. And when you look at the, uh, at the first step on a cyber attack, it's actually knowing when you've been attacked. And that sound, sounds very you know, banal to all of us, but honestly, if you look at the statistics, the average dwell time, and dwell is the word that's used in, that, in, in the uh, jargon of cybersecurity attacks, that takes for a corporation to actually realize that it's been attacked, can anybody make a guess? Nimrod, you're not allowed to answer that. I know you know the answer. No, it's 146 days. That's the global average. Now, the European average is three times that. So imagine the fact that you've been breached, you've been hacked, you've been attacked, and you have no idea that somebody's in your system. The average amount of machines that are being compromised in every cyber attack today arrives to 40 machines. So there is an incredibly long dwelling time in which your system has been compromised. Now, 
let's say you've actually realized that you've been compromised. And by the way, most of the attacks, most of the corporations, rather, that realize they've been attacked, don't realize it internally, but they learn about it from external sources that advise them they've been attacked. Um, so you, you know you've been attacked. What's the next step? Now, the, the first 72 hours are crucial, and I'll mention in a minute why I chose the number 72. So the first thing that needs to, to happen is you need to clean your system. Now, again, this sounds kind of obvious. Of course we have to clean the system, but it's not obvious. Many, many victims, many, many corporations that have been attacked don't properly clean their system. So what happens is they think they clean the system, but the hackers are still in there. And so they get attacked again and again, and there is a series of secondary attacks which come and follow. So, so the important first step, of course, is cleaning your system, and for this you need to be technologically covered in a, in a correct way. And then, and then comes, comes, of course, the very, very painful moment of notifications and disclosure. Now, that's, that's a very tricky part, and in, in a few minutes, uh, you know, the other moderator will, 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 will reflect about it, because when you actually want to notify, want to notify, you have to notify, and with GDRP coming and with the NIS directives, there's going to be very, very clear uh, uh, rules about when and how you need to notify. So there are a lot of considerations, actually, that need to be taken into place. Uh, if you're a listed company, you need to, to, to take into consideration what that would do to your share price. And we've seen uh, a variety of attacks. Uh, uh, I think it was uh, um, Equifax, for example, where the share price dropped in more than 30%. So there is, there, is, there is a share price to be considered. Then there is the issue of class actions. Uh, the minute this goes out public, you automatically expose yourself to class actions by all the offended parties that have been part, uh, that their, their information was compromised. Uh, uh, in the case of Yahoo, uh, uh, they've been subject to 43 class actions worldwide, which is incredible. And then you need to, of course, consider how do you manage the settlement agreements you want to actually arrive to with all the offended parties you can actually avoid, hopefully, those class actions. Uh, 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 Equifax actually did that, and they maintained, of course, a confidential agreement with all of them. Then, of course, there is the issue of the hackers. What do you do with the hackers? Do you pay the ransom? Do you not pay the ransom? Well, what many corporations do today in order to make the ransom appeasement appear more aesthetic, rather, is they retain the services of these hackers as consultants. So basically, they didn't really uh, yield to a ransom request now. What they did is they retained those hackers to test the system and to show them how they could make it better. And that also happens. Now, once that's that, once those notifications have been made, and once the, uh, the world knows that you've been attacked, and uh, by the way, if you look at the Uber attack, uh, 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 it took them almost a year to disclose to the market. It took them a couple of months to realize they were attacked, and then it took them a year to actually respond and, and, and disclose it to the market, which is a long, long period. Uh, so, so once that happens, the next step you need to do is you need to seriously uh, make a management shakedown because you need to look at your IT management, you need to look at your policies, you need to investigate internally what happened, uh, you need to work with law enforcement in order to cooperate and investigate the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the attack to the end. You need to many, many times create joint efforts with task forces in the Unicredit uh, attack. Uh, Unicredit and, and, and a bunch of other European banks created a task force among banks to cooperate and find a way. Uh, in the event of WannaCry, for example, uh, Microsoft immediately published a, a bunch of patchworks to their software in order to close the breaches. So all of these events happen in a very short period of time, and you need to be ready with a plan to confront them, because as I've mentioned, the regulation today is going in a direction that your notification requirements cannot be unduly delayed. GDPR speaks about 72 hours in certain cases. NIS speaks about avoiding undue delays. And that brings me to the last piece of words, and then I'm going to pass everything to my, to my colleagues. We as lawyers, what kind, of, what kind of products can we extract from this uh, uh, sequence? Now, there's a bunch of products. It's a long list. I want to focus on four items that, in my opinion, are the most important ones for lawyers in the spectrum of these attacks. First one concerns fiduciary duty of, duty of directors. The fact is that today, if a board of directors of a company does not assess their cyber risk and take proper action uh, uh, in order to defend 
and protect their corporation from that risk in a reasonable way, in a way that is proportional to the risk, and proportionality to the risk is the criteria we see today in the European uh, uh, language of the uh, various directives, then they would be in risk of, of legal action. That's one. Two, uh, compliance. I mean, there's a mountain of compliance requirements, and you need to be very well prepared for it. Four, three, you need to uh, prepare a plan for those immediate days from the moment in which you've been attacked to know exactly what to do. So in a crisis mode, you open a checklist and you run through it because there's sometimes no time to think. And fourth, which is very, very important, and I, we're going to hear more about it in a minute, is insurance, insurance coverage. The risk, the costs, the expenses are, are gigantic, are, are of a proportion that cannot be always uh, quantified in advance because you really don't know how severe the attack would be. So insurance coverage is going to be very important. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, Ariel. I think, Clarissa, you can pick up then on some of the points, especially the ending points, I think. What, what do we need to do to mitigate risk? We know that there's these risks out there. What are the kinds of steps people should be taking? And what are lawyers able to assist on? So just to add one point to Ariel's before I move on to mitigating things is privilege. For those of us who come from a common law system, if you can use lawyers to instruct your experts to um, instruct any third parties, you can, in contemplation of litigation and uh, structuring things around those concerns, the class actions, um, uh, etc., you can protect the information that you're getting so that you can create your report from your external people to come and look at your computer system that tells you it's woefully unprotected, is not available to uh, your shareholders. Uh, and what you do get is probably a, a, a report that um, says things in a slightly, let's Rosier. say, a more careful <laughs> way. Uh, but using privilege, thinking about privilege, that's where we as lawyers can really make a difference to the outcome of eventual litigation. I think I'd just add on that. I mean, we Israeli lawyers tend to have developed a, a little bit of a hard shell about privilege because in Israel it's, le it's a less developed concept than it is, let's say, in, in the UK or in the US. I think when it comes to cybersecurity, because we're working in an international environment and we're really exposed, we could be exposed to litigation in many different environments, I think we need to learn better how to protect our privilege. So, so moving on, how to mitigate, what should you be thinking about? I think every business, and by business I include law firms, thinking about uh, the very high profile DLA attack, should be mapping out what cyber uh, threats apply to them and put in place a risk management regime. That includes considering, does one of your current insurance plan per perhaps protect you? Do you need specialized insurance? What do you need to think about uh, in terms of who's got access to your systems? How are your systems being run? Uh, my second number two point is information security. Patch, patch, patch. I mean, it's, it's interesting. Ariel said Microsoft sent out the patch for WannaCry, and yet our whole, in England, our National Health Service was brought down by WannaCry ransomware. We saw TalkTalk, Talk, uh, a very high-profile attack, was uh, to do with a subsidiary that didn't patch. So a lot of these threats can be protected by having really good information security systems. Your network, who's got access to it? How do people who are using their mobiles, who are connecting to Wi-Fi at home, in the cafe, what access do people have to your network through third parties, through your lighting system, your air conditioning system? And thinking about, can it be separated into parts, keeping parts that uh, if you are attacked, you can separate and, and close down different parts of your network. Managing user privileges. We all know the WikiLeaks was caused by someone who, had who used user privileges 
from before that he no longer should have had access to that gave him access to classified information. So who's got access to what? When people leave, are you shutting down their, their privileges? Um, do people have the right privileges? Or are you giving people too much access? Number five, user education and awareness. We all know that we are the weakest link. So what education are you, have you got in place? I hear the latest phishing one is to send uh, CVs. And particularly to law firms, CVs are a big one. Uh, I would really like to train at your law firm. Please can I attach my CV? Or I'm thinking about moving to Israel. Um, I've been a lawyer for 20 years. Here's my CV. Bang. Um, and again, turning back to cyber insurance, uh, does it cover human error? Because if it doesn't, it should. Incident response. So Ariel's talked a little bit about that. But, and I won't go into too much detail, but think about who you're gonna call. It's what I call the Ghostbusters question. Who are you gonna call the Ghostbusters? Do you know if you're attacked, how to get hold of your CEO, how to get hold of the managing director of the law firm, how to uh, the CTO, the CIO, who do you want to be there on the day and how do you call them? What external people are you going to have? Do you know which lawyers you're going to call? Do you know which uh, incident response people? And if you do have insurance, have they been approved? And we've seen cases where clients have called in one set of lawyers and the insurers have called in another set. Clients have called in one incident report, computer specialists, and the insurers have called in another. All gets very messy. Uh, again, just to underline Ariel's point about GDPR, 72 hours. That's a very short amount of time, particularly if it's Rosh Hashanah, if it's Pesach, if it's Christmas. Uh, I, I recently did a talk on cyber with um, some incident responders who said Christmas Eve was ridiculous the number of attacks that they were asked to deal with. So what do you do at these random times and have you got plans in place? Then I talk about the four Ms, malware, monitoring, removable data and mobile working. All serious things. What are you doing about your malware? Do you have proper systems in place? Do they pick up the latest viruses, the latest attacks? Um, are you monitoring what's going on? Do you, does a person who's dealing with cyber, perhaps the GC, even understand the, the, the issues that are going on? Do your staff know, going back to, uh, to uh, us being the weakest link, all the issues that are going on? And lastly, back up your data. Do you have a way of getting hold of your critical data in the event all the systems are shut down for 24, 48, 72 hours? Can you file the cases at court if your computer systems were shut down? Can you pay your staff? Um, serious things that, and, and is it accessible quickly? Thank you. I think uh, Doron, uh, first of all, he's the non-lawyer on the panel, um, so he's very courageous for being here, and I appreciate that. Um, I, I, you know, Doron, give us a little bit of a context then from the more Israeli uh, environment. Uh, yeah, I will. I just uh, want you uh, one remark uh, to complete uh, what uh, Clarissa said uh, about uh, DRP BCP, uh, disaster recovery or uh, business continuity plans. Um, where do you keep? Do you have those plans? Where do you keep them? Uh, and and uh, who does what? Do you have a list of responsibilities? For example, the Twin Towers, September 11. Um, number one in the organization, injured. Number two was abroad, unreachable. Do anybody here knows who's number three in, in the organization? Uh, when, how, do you drill it, etc., etc. So I want to share you a bit of statistics about uh, Israel and globally. Uh, according to the Interpol, 10,000 cyber attacks per minute 
on Israel. According to Symantec survey, 24 countries, 20,000 internet users, every one second, 14 people globally are cyber attacked. More than 1 million per day or 430 million uh, per year. Surface chance for online attack is 1 per 2.27. Just to compare, airplane accident, 1 to 11 million. Or road accident with death, 1 to uh, 6,000. And cyber crime uh, cost per year, more than $400 billion. So, uh, according to this uh, survey, they said the time period for you uh, to deal with cybersecurity problem is the average of 10 days. And the treatment is uh, going with the regulators, info update, working with credit card companies, etc., etc. 39% of attackees reported this was the biggest harassment of their lives. Only 21% reported this to the police. They don't have to, but, but they did. 54% damage from combined attacks, like malware and viruses and whatever. 10%, I think it's much higher now than the survey, experienced smartphone attacks, like including smishing. Smishing is a SMS or text message a phishing, password hacking. And I will read this one slowly, and I cannot explain it, but according to the statistics, those who have been cyber attacked have twice chance, twice chance, to encounter physical crime, like robbery or whatever, the survey does not mention the reason. So, about the credit card uh, case and ID theft in, in Israel. So, uh, the first one was, well, the, the first documented one was in 2012 in Israel, uh, the Saudi hacker, 80 Israeli sites were hacked, 10,000 details stolen, 14 thousand credit card details, and other were citizens' ID and other uh, personal da data. Just five years uh, before that, 2007, Albert Gonzalez hacked to in into large stores, chain systems in the United States, TJ Maxx, etc., and uh, 41 million credit card details were stolen. So there are, I, I would say that there are four players or four aspects of this uh, thing. There's the credit, uh, credit card companies, financial sector. The other is the businesses, which we care about. The consumers, the consumers, sorry, of course. And then the governmental sector, which was in Israel, I would say, until uh, 2012, the missing link. Um, I would say that um, the triple uh, C, the credit card companies, financial sector, know how to protect themselves generally. Uh, from my point of view as a customer, I would say it's their responsibility. So they check the transaction prior to approval, uh, but listen to this. Financial sector is preferred by economic crime. Cybercrime is the second common economic crime, and only, uh, and, and sorry, third of the financial sector employees receive no training in cybersecurity, according to the businesses. Um, they, uh, they have statistics in the uh, credit card company, I would call them the triple C. 80% of businesses that have leaked uh, credit card data have ceased to exist within a year, within a year. 75% of the customers said they would not come back to a business that experienced a credit card uh, leak. And encryption of credit card data or other data on average is 15 times 15, one five times cheaper than leaks expenses. So if your uh, client as a business or you as a business selling a product or service through internet, your duty is to make sure your site is secured. Because in the case of the credit card companies, or what happened in Israel, uh, it wasn't uh, well hacked to the credit card uh, sites. It was hacked they were hacking to uh, the business's uh, website. So morally, business, economically, and legally, you have to do your risk management and do not store or ask for unnecessary data. For example, the ID. Uh, in the um, uh, Knesset, they have the uh, science and the technology and computer uh, committee. 
and they, and they, they are uh, tried to uh, look into, uh, have the ID as a, as a very, uh, well, it's, it's a very uh, sensitive information. Why? Because credit card number, I can change from today to uh, until tomorrow, no problem. But I cannot legally change my ID if I'm not a uh, state witness or turned uh, state uh, evidence, whatever. So that, that is a problem. So one can, uh, can uh, personate to myself. Um, I would say from a consumer point of view, uh, the, the word which, which uh, we must use is awareness. Because if we uh, um, teach uh, our uh, citizens not to pick flowers in the 70s in Israel, and then in the late 80s, not to um, turn in or reveal your secret code of the ATM card, then now you should not just hand over details on the internet, not with the credit cards or others, uh, because somebody can personate you. I tried it. Uh, the credit card companies in Israel do not uh, require an uh, ID number when you use the uh, credit card. But um, I, a week after this uh, session, the committee uh, uh, meeting in the Knesset, I was ordering pizza. And uh, she asked for my credit card, no problem, I can share this tomorrow, it's, it's no problem. Then she asked for me for ID. I said, no. You, you, you don't uh, need this, uh, this uh, detail. But the gas she station said, asks for it every time. The yeah, filling station asks the, for it every time. Gas station, gas station is uh, another thing, and governmental uh, ministries are another thing. But for businesses, they don't need this, uh, this detail. And I said, no. She said, uh, why? I said, it's, you don't need it. The credit card company said, it, you don't need it. I said, okay, I will try to complete the uh, transaction in the computer without the ID. Do you think she sh succeeded? Yes, she did. She did. And from, from then, that day on, I do not uh, pass my ID uh, number. So okay, that's for now. Excellent. Uh, Nimrod, I mean, obviously, all of the risks that we're talking about, all the attacks we're talking about, cause companies to take various preemptive actions. So I was wondering if you could address the preemptive actions, decoys, honeypots and the like, and, and any other area related to, to that kind of a preemptive or protective activity. Sure. Uh, I think it's important to say, you know, we are in a legal conference and as lawyers we sometimes tend to believe that the center of every activity is around lawyers. So to be honest, most of the companies I know the last thing they care is about the lawyers when they have their cyber incident. The last thing they care when they do cyber security is about the lawyers. To be honest, you are brought to the room only when there is catastrophe and there is no other way but to actually call the lawyers. Uh, so when we are asked to the room, I realize that catastrophe already happened, incident is already occurring and we need to notify someone. Why so? And I think here it's more interesting to understand. We do have a failing architecture currently of cybersecurity that leads to the point that, uh, and sorry if I have a different opinion, it's not about education. We like it's, that. It's not about whether users kind of like are more aware of cybersecurity. It's not about whether they keep the passwords or not. We do have architectural failure with the way that we design our systems. One has to understand. The way that we built actually all our economic infrastructures is on top, I'm coming for computer science, my actually postdoc in computer science. We built a society, an economic uh, kind of like functioning system on top of technology architecture which was not designed, not for trust, not for actually for authentication, and certainly not for confidentiality. The three elements that we care most about in security, which is actually availability, confidentiality, and integrity, these are three elements which was not, were not part of the design prospect of the internet. A magic happened. No one could have ever imagined in the 1990s that we'll be building our social, economic, business, community interactions on top of this failing architecture. And just to understand, by design, it's a failing architecture. 
to be honest, to spy on everyone or to steal data, it's by design enabled in the system. Why so? Because by design, the way we design a system that you can impersonate in the protocol or can actually inject any node into the protocol and build it without any need, not for trust, not for authentication, and not for any permissioning. So by design, both stealing the data, impersonating, hacking into systems, just by design. That's the way we design the protocols. So we are, li we are living with a situation that la later we come to it and we say, hey, I had a cyber incident. I invite any one of you to visit one day actually a cyber operations center, not sitting in the law firm, but visiting a cyber operations center. All these numbers that you are citing and everything, the truth of the matter is that we do have random number of millions of attacks daily on organization. When I met the CIO of Coca-Cola, he says that he is experiencing on average 600,000 attacks daily. Are these serious attacks? No. Are these something in an incident that you need to call your lawyer? Not really. It's the fact that by design we know that there are many attempts that seems to be actually malicious attacks that are recorded in the system. The incentive of all the security companies, let's assume that you buy a security company, it says, actually, in the last year I didn't find any incident. Would you ever buy their product again? Certainly not. So all of them have by actually incentive to design the system to alert as many incidents as possible. So I'm, I'm sitting on the board of some cyber companies and they says the problem with our cl their clients is that they don't really see what our system is doing. So actually we started creating alerts. Alerts for minor issues, for issues that you should check. We are bombarded with alerts. In the stem of technology we call it alert fatigue. Alert fatigue. And the truth of the matter, when we say you have to notify, you never have to report an incident, most organizations are kind of happy with the situation that they have hundreds of thousands of alerts. Why so? Because you don't need to report anything. You don't have an incident, you have just alerts, you need to investigate them. Honestly, you don't have the tools to investigate so many of them, and no one wants to notify their clients. The situation that you actually know that you have an incident and you have to notify the clients, most of the time is because someone is actually extorting you or because something leaked. It's not because you experienced a cyber incident. So let's be honest. It's not that the organization wants to know that they're under attack and they're lacking the tools. It's not that they really want to have these po great policies that please lawyers develop policies for us so we'll be able to report our clients who understand we answered incidents. That's not the case. The truth of the matter, we know that we're under attack. We know that most of our critical assets are vulnerable by design. And most of the time we try to live by the boundaries of the law. However, what we can do in order to actually protect ourselves. Everybody understand that in cybersecurity, we were taking the wrong approach for many years. We call it the reactive approach or actually the gates approach. When you're speaking about firewall, what is a firewall? Firewall is basically understanding, saying, okay, I'm putting kind of a wall here and trying to zone. It's kind of like a zoning of planning uh, strategy for cybersecurity. It could work 20 years back, which each organization has its own network and any own infrastructure, and they were isolated from each other. So we actually were secured by being isolated from each other. That's no longer a valid paradigm for security. We're interconnected. We're actually relying on untrusted ar architecture by design. We're all actually not using our own network, but using external network, external cloud provider, external telecom networks. So by design, we are trusting untrusted systems. Another thing, when we brought our cellular phones or our own devices into the network, we actually introduces what we call bring your own device, malicious, potentially malicious uh, um, hardware into a network that could not protect against it. So what's the solution? Every security expert would say, go proactive. What does it mean, go proactive? If you are concerned about the scenario that you have an attacker, put an entrapment, put a decoy. We used to call it honeypots. We used to call it that put actually a lucrative asset and see who is actually trying to steal your asset. Instead of saying, okay, I had an incident, create the incident. Another thing, most organizations I know prefer to do what we call penetration testing or vulnerability assessment on a paper, on a piece of paper. They don't dare actually attack their own system. Why so? Because the CISO is so afraid from the obvious that the attack would succeed. 
the only way to actually check how vulnerable you are and what will be the catastrophe is actually attacking your own system. When I used to be a cyber officer in the Israeli army, we call it red team. I played the enemy most of the time. Attack your own system. See how vulnerable it is. So see what the catastrophe and how you actually fail gracefully. When you're speaking about continuous uh, disaster plans and continuous uh, business plan, honestly, it's documents in the drawer. No one ever practiced them. Only when you attack your own system and your system fails and you understand how it fails, you understand actually what's the impact. I've been overseeing, I think, something like 50 cyber, major cyber incidents around the, the last three years. Uh, I'm the general counsel with Team 8. Team 8 is one of the leading incident response team. And we oversee also several others, actually. Now I think they renamed it to Signia. So we see a lot of major incidents. One thing we learned from all these major incidents is actually that only organizations that plan the hand of the time for this failure, which just is likely to happen for any organization because you don't really have security measures that can stop it, and we're practicing a failure, and graceful failure of the organization, and actually had this proactive approach. Let's gather intelligence ahead of time and see who is actually attacking us and understand the motivation and understand how it works vis-a-vis -vis this enemy. Only those that talk pro take proactive approach could actually handle an incident. And all the others, it's just a flip of a coin. You are lucky if you are not being the one uh, that actually now exposed for having an incident. And the number that we all, the names we're all citing as uh, we're saying, uh, Tesco and uh, Bank of America and all the other names we keep citing, just random names that happen to have a failure that got publicity. All organizations fail in cybersecurity on a daily basis. The question is how you plan for this failure. And that's we haven't mastered yet. Thank you. Uh, we as lawyers uh, deal a lot with allocation of risk. And I was hoping, Alan, maybe you could help us a little bit understand how the risk of cyber attacks, cyber threats can be addressed, let's say, in the contractual setting or relationship between vendors and customers and in that kind of a forum. Well, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about vendors in a second, but let me see if I can take some of these points and kind of distill sure. it into what I view as sort of a practical approach to this problem now and put it in the context of the legal market that we all operate in. I think until, I don't know, just a few years ago, two, three, four at the most years ago, getting anyone to a uh, company to spend money on prophylactic measures and preparatory measures was almost impossible. So where were lawyers mostly involved? They were on breach response. Uh, if a company got, got uh, hit, then of course everybody would spend whatever it takes to do it. So that's really where the focus for, for lawyers was. Um, you know, it's been said many times, there are really only two types of companies, those that have been hacked uh, or had a breach and know it, and those that have had a breach and don't know it. I mean, every company uh, eventually has it, but as people have become more sensitive to this, and it's been mentioned uh, in terms of directors worrying about liability now, uh, in terms of you know the new uh, changes in the various regulatory regimes, most recently GDPR, which is driving a lot of change in that, all of a sudden, in just the last couple of years, there's a sensitivity to the need to prepare, but many companies have been doing nothing for years and years and years. Uh, and so the question is, how can we help and how do we come, in, come involved? In our experience, uh, this point that um, Clarissa raised earlier about um, privilege cannot be overemphasized. Uh, our experience is that while lawyers are generally uh, despised by the technical people and they want the lawyers as far away as possible, once they understand that by having the lawyers involved and doing things under the directions mm -hmm. of lawyers, they can be protected, you know, to the point, you know, you were making about everybody worrying about pointing that when there's a breach, everybody wants to point the fingers at, uh, at somebody else. One thing that we found very effective is explaining that privilege can help keep a lot of the details uh, under wrap. That, that actually does help uh, form a bond between the technology people and the cyber people and the lawyers in the, in the beginning. Uh, and then the many of the um, threats that companies face, they're, they're not just financial. They are financial and they can be significant, but there's reputational threats. There are also government and regulatory oversight and you know, consent orders from some regulatory authorities and things like that. These are big impediments that create com competitive disadvantages for business. Um, 
you know, GDPR, the new European regulation coming into effect in May, is scaring everybody because it allows for potential penalties up to 4% of worldwide turnover, which is a very scary number. Or if it was due, do we actually think that they're going to be that large? And in most cases, probably not. But what can be done to try to make sure that when you have to deal with a regulator, whether it's in the States or in Europe or a data protection authority in any other country, um, if you think about it, they're like, in some senses, any other prosecutorial entity, right? They have limited capabilities, limited staff. So how do they choose their enforcement actions? They choose things that are going to make an important statement, a statement they think is important to the marketplace. So a lot of the exercise is making yourself a less um, favorable target uh, for an enforcement action. And everybody, um, I think, seems to focus, particularly now on GDPR, everybody's in a rush to figure out how do we be 100% compliant. Almost no company is going to be 100% compliant on May 25th. This is going to be an ongoing, um, uh, an ongoing process. But creating a record that you've thought about it, that you've taken these things into account, that you've made decisions to maximize what you can do with the resources you have available at any given time will go a long way toward dealing with regulators later on. Because what they're looking for are cases where people haven't done that, and they're going to make a statement to the market with uh, enforcement. Activities. Just to emphasize that, we've seen that for a long time in fraud cases. And there's um, quite a famous case of a big bank that um, there was serious fraud by one of their employees and bribery. And they, when the enforcement action happened, they looked at the number of times the employees had been trained and the, the processes that were in place to prevent bribery and fraud. And um, the fine was minimal because the response was that they'd put in place enough to protect and to educate uh, in place and we're going to see more and more of that in this cyber environment. Maybe I'll, I'll add on that just uh, in the Israeli environment clients tend to be very reluctant to invest in that kind of training and that kind of uh, preparation. We see that in the FCPA context, we see it in insider trading context before that. Um, I think you know for those of us that do practice here I think there needs to be an education process because the cybersecurity regulation exposure for Israeli companies is greater than in most other areas. I mean, we touch all the world. And I think if we don't do that education process, we're going to be on the, on the bad side of that equation. Uh, I think that, again, we are overemphasizing the regulatory aspect. To be honest, most of the organization I spoke with care very little about regulatory exposure. With cyber incidents and with privacy, their concerns are it's a PR concern, it's a reputation concern. In most of the cases I dealt with a huge data leak, leakage in organization, with a huge cyber incident breach of the organization, the regulatory aspects or the claims was the least of their concern. The main concern was that, just you know, to give you an, an idea of incidents we dealt with, you are a pharmaceutical company and someone actually hacked into the production site and could handle the formula that you are producing. Regulatory liability is the list of their problem at that moment. You are a financial company, you are just about to go IPO and you have uh, 20,000 uh, actually clients uh, with all their financial records that now actually you have a ransomware attack, someone extorting you, that actually took your data. You are concerned about it being notified, about PR, about the lifetime value of your clients, about migration to competitors. I think that if we are overemphasizing either the fines in the GDPR or regulatory exposures or litigation, these are not the concerns. We as lawyers would need to be aligned with what actually the clients care about most. Well, and I, I think I, even I think with the, the SEC that you so said... Let's talk about the SEC, because in the, in the FCPA context, at least, the SEC involvement changed the whole equilibrium there. I, yeah, and I, I would say I think times are changing, too. I mean, that is what you've said is clearly historically been true. But I think that that is changing now, and people are, are realizing that the same things that protect you from uh, in the regulatory environment can also be helpful in a PR context, basically, where you can 
uh, demonstrate all the things you've done. Nobody is completely um, hack-proof at the end of the day. So there's, there's different issues here. There's the, there's the technological solutions and barriers, but there's the risk mitigation, both financial and reputational. And the more you can demonstrate that you've done, the better positioned you are, uh, I think, in all those fronts. And, uh, and I do think that the regulatory piece of it, and I think GDPR has made a big difference here because of the, the very large um, potential fines, is changing people's point of view on how much they're, uh, they are worried about this. That's been our experience anyway. I think you're absolutely right that PR is something that we all, well, we worry about, our clients worry about, and that can just wipe millions off a share price in minutes. I think that the, um, the regulatory aspect and uh, other fears are what's getting the directors on the board to say, now, everyone's talking about this, what have we got in place? What are we doing to protect ourselves? So it's really a bit of both. It's what, when it happens, yes, PR, but beforehand getting the board to say, are you doing it properly? And, and just one remark about regulators, uh, the SEC in Israel are more and more demanding these new regulations, for example, the uh, trade arena or others, uh, in the regulations and new regulations, you need to, um, to uh, when, you have, uh, when you want to uh, achieve a license, then uh, you need an auditor's opinion, uh, which says that the um, IT systems and cyber, etc., etc., are according to this ISO, whatever, or this uh, other, um, whatever uh, standard, and uh, it's, uh, well, uh, you can rely on it. So without it, you don't get the license. I'd like to, uh, I'd like to, uh, to agree completely with, uh, with what Alan said. Uh, when we look today what's happening with European regulators, uh, when they look and they audit the systems, they're looking today in two main areas. One is the way you do your marketing, and the other one is the standard of your security system. And the fact, as you correctly mentioned, that the uh, regulation GDPR and NIS go a long way in specifying the architecture the criteria of your security standards will mean that we will be accountable on a regulatory level, with our clients rather, to exactly adhering to that standard. And if we don't, we're going to be in trouble. Again, I'm not playing the devil's advocate, but I want to make it a little bit more interesting here. Uh, again, let's, let's play it with GDPR, and I'm doing a lot of GDPR projects, but let's play it seriously. If you go GDPR and you're the lawyer, you're advising your clients have anonymized data or have the data hashed. If you keep the data in storage or in transit, keep it uh, encrypted. Do not keep unnecessary pieces of data. Do not possess data that you do not get the authorization. We all know that. But at the root of the matter, then you come to IT people and they said, oh, that's a great idea. But I can close my business if I actually do that. Because if I do not have identified data, I cannot correlate pieces of data between data sectors. If I do have the data encrypted either in REST or in transit, I could not actually process the data for meaningful data. Big data architecture that enables me in real time to analyze the stream requires me actually to have plain text streams. So they actually come to you and say, we understand what the GDPR and the Europeans meant, but we actually want to do some business. So what's your advice on actually how to handle this. And here we, we all know, we are coming with all these great legal minds of data reduction that we a little bit know what does it mean, data reduction, that you don't have IP32, you have IP29, like Google did, and says, hey, we don't have actually GDPR data anymore. Or you're doing actually data sets that seem not to be correlated with each other, but we have a statistical mechanisms to actually correlate them and making them identifiable. So actually, even here, what you ask from your lawyers, be creative with me. Because if I just actually apply the legal rules, I can might uh, not have the foul percent exposure of risk, but I'm not going to be actually competitive in my business. So be creative. Do you have actually a technological or architectural solution for me that I could live finally with the GDPR but keep my business? And I think that's the challenge for lawyers mm -hmm. now, to understand big data architecture, to understand how predictive modeling happening on large data sets 
can you actually analyze unidentified data? And I think here, if you look at Israel, by the way, you see interesting innovation. Look at Mediclone, for example, an interesting Israeli company that says, okay, we understand if we take health data and anonymize it mm -hmm. or make it de-identifiable, we cannot operate with it. So they have actually statistical modeling to synthesize the data. So you can do any experiment you want or any clinical trial with the data while it's being GDPR or privacy protected. That's, I think, what our clients are asking from us. Be creative, understand our technology, don't go to GDPR clauses and cite them for us, but find solutions that are working with technology architectures. I, I think you're absolutely right. Again, um, business is the business of our clients. And you see so many times, I've been an in-house lawyer uh, in both risk situations and it, it's the biggest annoyance when you have lawyers saying, oh, you can't do this, you can't do that, or, oh, this is the biggest issue. And you say, well, actually, if I can't get this business to work, I can't pay your fees. <laughs> uh, there's no point in GDPR, there's no point in data, there's no point in cyber if we don't have a business in the first place. So absolutely, we've got to be creative. We've got to find ways where we can help our clients do business. Okay, I want to take this opportunity to thank the panel. Our time has run out. I also want to thank the organizers. I want to say if this conference had been held 20 years ago, I suspect there would be about 10 law firms from overseas. And I think it's an incredibly impressive turnout. Uh, panelists, I'm sure, will be available for questions afterwards. And thank you very much.